The Odyssey of Torchmouth. Chapter one. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Torchmouth, your resident weirdo for today. I wasn't always Torchmouth. I was born in Tao Andrew Shu to parents that had only been in America for three years. I quickly learned how the communication barrier that my parents faced was negatively affecting their careers and ability to integrate into society. Chinese was the only language spoken in our home at the time. I was able to become bilingual before starting school thanks to my undying love of Sesame Street. <laughs> this was my first step, mentally and physically, towards accomplishing my strange mission on this planet. Chapter two, a new name. Unfortunately, Sesame Street didn't teach me everything I needed to know about fitting in. Upon entering elementary school, I was quickly dubbed a hyperactive outcast by my teachers and peers. Much to my parents' dismay, my failed integration led to many disciplinary meetings by age six. This volatile behavior was blamed on my name being spelled with the Chinese character meaning fire. To combat my already erratic temperament, my parents changed the symbol to mean the sound wind makes as it flows through the pine trees. <laughs> A valiant effort, I'm sure. But the spark had already ignited and the fire roared on within me. Chapter three, communication. As the child of immigrants, I was expected to pursue a career of prestige and preferably make a lot of money. I was told that being a computer scientist, a doctor, or a lawyer would be acceptable. Instead, I focused on my communication skills and interests outside of these chosen paths. When it came time to choose what I would study in college, my rebellious nature got the better of me. I did what every immigrant parent fears most. I went to art school. <laughs> Chapter four, Albert Chong. Even in my chosen major, I had blatant disregard for learning in a classroom setting. My creativity was burning a hole through every attempt I made at being a normal art student. Not long after starting school, I found myself doing poorly in classes, but meeting all the right people. The professors became my good friends, and my good friends became my mentors. Having professors like Albert Chong was, a crucial, was crucial to feeding my confidence as an artist. He saw my spark rather than my letter grade. He supported me as I failed out of his, of his photography class. And he helped me combat the crushing weight of being dubbed, yet again, a failure in society. Under his mentorship, I was able to learn and experience far more of the art world than I did in any of my classes. Chapter five, leaving art school. Over a three-year span in art school, I had faced academic probation twice. For me, it wasn't the right place to grow as an artist. My classes were focused on the rules of art, and my inner inferno had had enough. I was determined to become an artist my way. I left school and moved into a warehouse unit in the mountains. For years, I survived on things like gas station condiments and complimentary saltine crackers. I began building sculptures with anything I could get my hands on. I even received high praise from a gallery for a sculpture I built with cat urine stains on it. <laughs> the colorful patina on the salvaged metal amazed them. <laughs> I really didn't have the heart to tell them that they were gazing at stray cat urine in awe. <laughs> Chapter six, Dina Kalahar. Through my continuous networking and much determination, 
I was able to acquire my next mentor. Dina Kalahar is an accomplished glass sculptor. The quality of her work was astounding. So I readily absorbed every lesson she had to teach. I started training with her regularly. And soon, I installed a glass blowing studio into my warehouse unit. I put more faith in my instincts than in other people's desires for my life. I was then able to excel in a field that wasn't a previously known option. Chapter seven, Taiwan. I continued to grow and experiment as a glass sculptor. I was able to deeply resonate with the difficult nature of glass work. This medium is easily broken when not given the correct conditions to thrive. I worked countless hours with many mentors to evolve into a greater artist. I was able to obtain more skills to help convey the creative outpourings of my brain. This chapter of my life resulted in me being invited to tour Taiwan and show my glass sculptures in a museum. Chapter eight, Sifu Lu. Glass blowing and sculpting comes in many forms. I was lucky enough in my travels to cross paths with an animal sculptor, Sifu Lu. He was so committed to his craft that he spent three years just perfecting his horse sculpting. I studied with him for four months, subsequently captivated by his technique. I came back the next year for four more months. Chapter nine, Sifu Simon. My quest for knowledge didn't stop with glass. The martial arts have been a passion of mine since I was a child. <laughs> While in Taiwan, my aunt introduced me to an expert of well over five disciplines. I knew it was time to adopt a new mentor into my collection. Sifu Simon helped me channel my raging inner fire into the brutal art of Xingyi. Upon moving back to the States, I continued my martial arts studies at a local Aikido dojo. I learned fighting techniques and self-defense. Aikido also introduced meditation, discipline, and focus into my life, as well as my artwork. Chapter 10, collaboration. My communication and networking skills grew over the years of sculpting and selling glass. I was able to start collaborating with specialists in different fields. I met a dedicated mad scientist, Aaron Ristow. His experiments in high voltage result in the most fascinating displays. The combination of glass blowing and electronics stemmed an invitation to contribute research and development to Meow Wolf's Omega Mart in Las Vegas. Aaron's pursuit of rediscovering lost technology continues to produce unimaginable results. He inspired me to test my own combination of skill sets. Chapter 11, metal. I always loved working with metal. Over the years, I've had many welding, bronze casting, and blacksmithing instructors. I would venture off into other interests, but would often find myself yearning to build with metal again. I happened upon a grant opportunity for a Valentine's Day festival. I decided it was time to formulate a team. Many of my mentors, allies, and friends assembled to help me construct my first large-scale sculpture. We lovingly dubbed this winged fire spouting monster Ant Eros, or better known as the Dark Cupid. <laughs> His backstory is one of heartache and betrayal that many people can relate to. At the time, I was discontent with the idea of love. Through this display of fury, I was able to connect with far more audience members than I could have ever imagined. 
the dark Cupid continues to travel the front range with his 30-foot flames of wrath. <laughs> Chapter 12, Johnny Chinaman. I journeyed on to make my own sculpture to bring awareness to the plight of my ancestors. Did you know Chinese immigrants were not eligible for United States citizenship until 1943? Many Chinese immigrants came to the US to escape the Qing Dynasty and impoverished state of China at the turn of the 19th century. Upon arriving here, they were met with indentured servitude and inhumane living conditions, paid just pennies a day and deemed expendable by the railroad companies. These men lost their identities. They became lists of numbers to their employers. Many immigrants were sent to their deaths with dynamite in hand. Tunnels needed to be made through the mountains for tracks to be laid. This was only a small price for the railroad companies. This forgotten history inspired the rage and perseverance I needed to create Johnny Chinaman. His ball and chain hairstyle is symbolic of the mandatory hairstyle for men in China at the time. His hairstyle was an easy way for the immigrant workers to be identified and targeted with violent prejudice. Race was the ball and chain that kept them behind. Chapter 13, Inspiration. By refining my welding, I was able to participate in the construction of massive sculptures and show them at many festivals, including Burning Man. That network exploded into meeting and making props for fire spinners. With my knowledge of metalwork, martial arts, and fire, I was able to integrate seamlessly into a newfound family. After my introduction into the fire spinning world, I had a taste of performance art. I had found an oasis for my strangeness. Chapter 14, Rebirth. If you haven't noticed yet, fire is the common thread in my rather uncommon life. One day I was welding a helmet out of scrap metal, because, well, why not? When it dawned on me that the helmet would be able to support the weight of the glass torch, I then got to work welding elements to the mouth of the helmet that would allow me to attach a torch. I hooked up my gas lines, and from the flames of my rebellion, the torch mouth persona was born. <laughs> Torchmouth now travels Colorado, spouting a 5,000 degree flame and leaving glass animals for audience members. It is an art and creation that's one of a kind. In spite of the great plan society had for me, my goal is to show people that if there isn't a place for you, then perhaps it is your destiny to create one, with the approval of local fire marshals, of course. <laughs> Chapter 15, Freedom. The ability to express yourself is not learnable in school or purchasable in an art store. It comes from a fire within that refuses to stop burning in the face of adversity. I've gone hungry for months, lived in storage units and warehouses. I've been known to be a couch guest more than once. If I were a computer scientist today, I would not have had those hardships, but I would have also missed out on all of the great adventures my life has provided. Chapter 16, Passing the Torch. I'm by, no main, I'm by no means saying to drop out of school, quit your job, or be homeless. I'm saying that you know yourself better than anyone in this world. It is your job from birth to continue to explore who that person is. Allow them to grow and evolve. Torchmouth is a beacon to my community. It is a love letter to those around me. Maybe someone in their 60s sees me and picks up a hobby they abandoned years ago. Perhaps a young child is mesmerized by the flames and starts to explore performance art. These are the chain reactions that feed my internal flame and allow my creativity to flow into the next project. <laughs>